Good morning, everybody. Discipline or disappointment? It's probably something that flashes through your mind um, the moment you hear a phrase like that. Um, some ways you could probably preach yourself a sermon, and I can just sit back down. <laughs> You know, I was kind of noodling on um, some other sermon ideas. One was just things that are outside of my control, outside of your control. Um, The older I get, the more I feel like fewer and fewer things are within my control. Uh, And I, you know, I think... God expects us to see that. I think he expects us to see it sooner rather than later. I think in our youth, uh, we tend to think that we have control of more than we really do. And as we get older in age, we realize we really don't control anything at all. Um, And the sooner we humble ourselves and depend on God, the better off we're going to be. But this morning's sermon is about, even though that, that is the reality, there are not a lot of things that we control but we can control ourselves and the things that are within our capability to do, we must do. Now, I don't want this to be a sermon of, well, just get your act together because that's really hard to do. But these are things that we must do. There, there is no other choice. The world hates this idea Right? They hate the idea of discipline. They certainly hate the idea of spiritual and moral discipline. In Psalm 2, it's a very common verse. I probably use it too much. But Psalm 2, verse 3, let us break... Well, let's back up. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Most people do not want discipline. They don't want to be bound by God. And that's increasingly the case in our society, that people just don't want, they want to be disciplined, but they're often disciplined about the wrong things. They're disciplined about their health and uh, being in shape and what can I do to make myself happy Those kind of things are where people are putting their attention for discipline, but not on their moral bearing. The world just, they hate this idea. But which one do you want? Like you see that flash before you, you know which one you want to be, right? Do I really need to say much more? You know you want to be in the disciplined camp. And I like things like this. They're these dichotomies. They're, it's binary. It's, it's a simple choice. It's nice when we can kind of break things down to simple choices. Well, you either do this or you do that. It's a choice. Which one do you want? Discipline or disappointment? And how are you set free? Going back to the world example and the, the bonds that are put upon us, the world often sees that as being enslaved, not the path of freedom, uh, the, a path of bondage. I don't want that. But how are you really set free? And you can see this in earthly things. It doesn't have to be spiritual things. How are you set free even in earthly things? It's by being disciplined about whatever it is that gives you the confidence in whatever that thing is. We know it's not by doing nothing, and doing nothing leads to disappointment. So what got me thinking about this idea uh, was a quote from Nick Saban, uh, Alabama coach football. I don't listen to him, watch him, but I came across the quote. Uh, I think it's probably one of his more popular ones, but there are two pains in life. Keyword pain. There's the pain of discipline and the pain of disappointment. If you can handle the pain of discipline, then you'll never have to deal with the pain of disappointment. And it's a reality of life. There there is going to be pain. There is no getting around the pain. 
It's again a reality of getting older. There is no way to get around the pain. The pain is coming. Right? It'll come in your health. It'll come in the people you know, their health declining. It is the nature of the course of life. The pain is there. But what did Jesus say? If you're going to suffer, then suffer for doing what? For doing good. You take up the best possible cause of suffering and you don't get stuck in the disappointed view of doing nothing. What do you want your freedom in Christ to be used for? The verse that Brent read, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, as a way to sin, but instead as bond servants, enslaving yourself to God, but the way we set ourselves free. Have you found yourself on either side of this equation? in your life, in your spiritual journey? Once again, I'm trying to be apathetic. I get it. Discipline's really hard. (laughs) I'm saying, get it right, do it. But I think we've all, with age, have found ourselves on one side of this, probably at at many different intervals in our life, either being in the discipline camp or the disappointed camp, disappointed with ourselves, But which one do you want to be? Which one do you want to experience more than the other? Which one do you want to be known for? I think Steve had made, it may have been comments at the Lord's table a while back, but something about trying to think about what you want to be remembered as and how that can alter the way you live your life and That is a good carrot to hang out there for yourself. What do you want to be known for? Uh, Many of you who are on Facebook and otherwise are probably aware that Matt Basford passed away uh, this past week. I did not know Matt. I'm sure some of you did. Uh, If you don't know him, he's written a lot of the hymns. He's recent. I mean, he's in our lifetime. A lot of the hymns we've sang throughout our life are people, you know, 18th century. Matt Basford uh, passed away this week from Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. But he's a Christian in our time who seems to have left a mark. As a songwriter, as a student of God's word. And in spite of that pain, he wrote songs like A Foretaste of Your Rest, Be Strong and Courageous, Exalted, Let us know Jehovah, purify us, savior and friend, servant song, the rock of my heart. You guys recognize those hymns, right? So how did someone like Matt accomplish this? This is what I think of. It's the discipline, right? He's disciplined in spiritual things. I want to read something. It's called The Things I Don't Want to Do. I don't want to get up in the middle of the night and change wet sheets or listen to my daughter's cry. I don't want to lie restless for the next few hours, anxious about the day that's coming with the sun's rise. I don't want to drag myself out of bed enacting a morning routine. I don't want to drive my car for an hour to work, contemplating impossible dreams. I don't want to slog through work, doing things I don't care to do. I don't want to hear my boss shout and say, do it better too. I don't want the unexpected to pop up throughout the day. I don't want distractions caused by others to put me out of my way. I don't want to cook dinner to sweep, pick up, and clean. I don't even want to get a shower. It slows me down from other things. I don't want to put the kids to bed, a long, drawn-out ordeal. I don't want to sit in silence on the couch, 
thinking about how I feel. I don't want to go to bed, which means the day must end. I'll likely wake up in the morning and be disappointed once again. That's my life. I wrote that yesterday. <laughs> but have you ever had a day like this? Or several? Uh, have you ever been tempted when you wake up in the morning and the day starts off like that to take the day off, to call in sick from work? And I found something. There are days that you take off intentionally, and those are okay. But when you wake up and you start the day like that and you take the day off, did taking the day off actually make you feel better? It probably made you feel worse. Not saying don't recover. I don't, do not take what I'm saying. Sometimes you have to take the days and you got to live and learn. But there's something about not pushing through. So much, so much of what we do, uh, even the basic things in life, are about perspective. Our motivations, our vantage points, or points, uh, can make all the difference in how we approach and perceive the things that we do every day. Now that list was more earthly focused. I'm sure there's some spiritual elements you can take out of that, but what about spiritual things? Um, abstaining from evil. Are there certain things you know you need to abstain from to keep away and you just keep finding yourself back there and back in a place of disappointment? You know, discipline is not just about the things that, doing the things that we need to do, it's weeding out the things that we know are bad for us, the things that aren't going to do us any good, the bad habits. But abstaining from things that are just going to draw you down into the dross. What about practicing right things? The things that you know will set your relationship right between you and God. The things that kind of gnaw at you, that you know are there, I need to be doing this. And we can spend a lot of time sitting in a place of disappointment instead of doing what we need to do. It's doing good for your fellow man. Opportunities that you see pop up, you could jump in, you could act, you could do. And instead, you sit back and you actually end up disappointed. Ah, I should have done that. I should have gone. I should have been there. What about prayer? Prayer is a good place. If you're like me, through my life, I've been in good spots, I've been in bad spots. I've been consistent, I've been inconsistent. I need to be consistent. And prayer is not an optional thing. We talked about earlier, suffering Pain, the age, the older you get, it is not an option. It, you need God. There's no way around it. There are things you cannot control. The sooner you figure out that you need to pray and put your dependence on God, I know when, I'm saying this, I'm not good at it, but I know inherently it is, it is a truth. It is a reality. The sooner I figure out I need to pray, and I need to pray now, I need to be dependent on God now, I need to humble myself now, I know the better off I will be. I, I thought about bringing up, uh, I'd gone another route. Uh, uh, oh, now I'm losing my train of thought, but the, the two men who pray, right? And the one's humbling himself, the other man is, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. And oftentimes we focus on how many times he says, I, but think about that prayer from a viewpoint of control how one person has not relinquished control.
But speaking about control, what about controlling your tongue? Are the things that you are coming out of your mouth that you utter, are they becoming things that you're disappointed in? You can't put the cap back on the bottle. And once it's come out, it has come out. Controlling your thoughts. The starting point for many of the things that we do. Are you disciplined in how you control what pops into your head? Reading scripture. We know what that does for us. The constant pouring in of God's truth into our heart. What about worship? Not just in this building, but throughout the day. Your faith. Is faith something to be disciplined in? Or is faith, is faith just something you have? Or is it a matter of discipline? I think it's a matter of discipline. You have to remind yourself to be faithful. Gratitude. And love. How do you do with these things? What is the antidote to your spiritual disappointment? I don't know that I have all the answers, but I know a big part of it is to have your eyes fixed on God, to be connected to Him, to the why, we're, the why that you're here, the why that we're here, and then to be disciplined in your actions to do what is right and to move forward even when you don't feel like it, to not give up, to not stop. What if Jesus had stopped? You might say it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. The why. The motivation. Love your neighbor as yourself. The discipline. The living it out. Why be disciplined in the first place? It's kind of an inherently bad question. It's kind of like asking, well, why grow up? Isn't that kind of a dumb question? Why grow up? Well, do you want to be a baby forever? And what do you suppose happens to children who are never disciplined? I'm not saying we're perfect. That little girl is giving us a run for our money. Brayla. Oh my. What do you think happens to children who are never disciplined? We know, we know the end result. Why did Jesus subject himself to discipline? Ultimately, he wanted to please the Father. Right? In Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, looking at him and his example of discipline, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy is not only for Jesus. The message is, is that it's for you and I. The joy set before us, to reach maturity and become the person that God desires you to become. To not be happy with that where you're at today, but to do better. And not for the sake of doing better, for the sake of becoming what God wants you to be. In Hebrews 12, you can read that entire chapter. It is a chapter of discipline. Now, no discipline or chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. 
Pursue peace with all people. Is peace a matter of discipline? Think about the unrest you've had in the relationship. Is it a matter of discipline? Yes. Pursue peace. Pursue holiness. Is holiness a matter of discipline? Oh my. Yes. Without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. Is rooting out bitterness a matter of discipline? How do you keep yourself from being bitter, from becoming a bitter person? And by this, many become defiled. You kind of think, reading through this chapter, that he's switching context, but no. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Fornication, adultery, being tempted to engage in that. It's a lack of discipline. Don't be undisciplined like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Which camp did Esau end up in? He was very disappointed for lack of discipline. I was going to bring these in this morning, but my wife thought it was a really bad idea. I'm like, I'm not going to play them. I'm not. I'm just going to hold them up here for an example. Um, so these are two guitars that I own. You can tell that the style of this guitar is the same, right, between these two pictures. Make the orientation right. These gu- guitars had... Different amounts of attention and value put into them when they were crafted. All right. Anybody who knows guitar probably can spot the difference right away. That one on the left is an Epiphone, right? This one is a Gibson. Some people in the guitar world would call that the poor man's Gibson, the poor man's Les Paul. It's an Epiphone, it's not a Gibson. And they do little things to make you aware that they're different. The headstock is not the same. It's a different shape. I didn't get captured very well there, but headstock, you would notice that right away. Ah, that's, that's the real McCoy right there. And you might spot some other differences. You can tell the fretboard on that one, the rosewood is a little bit darker than that. It's probably treated better. The uh, inlays, trapezoid, they're nicer shaped. The components are higher end. Uh, it's sanded by hand, the one over here. It's about twice the value, that one, about twice the value of that. Now, I said poor man's guitar. I think I paid $600 for that guitar. But in the guitar world, that's still, you know. But that one's double in value. I'll tell you why. Don't get offended by this, because she bought me this guitar. (laughs) I love that guitar. Because that's where the discipline is. If you were to see that guitar up close, you would see the, the frets are very worn down. They need replaced. I know where the divots are, because whenever I would bend notes, I knew, okay, I've got to kind of work around that right there. You would see the scratch marks on the lacquer of the body, on the pick guard, where my pick has struck it. You would see that my sweat from my hand and my palm had started to wear down the electronics, the pickups there and the bridge. You would see the back is a little bit ruffled up. The strings on that guitar have been changed hundreds of times. 
I remember, I don't remember whose house it was, but I remember going to somebody's house and like most people, a lot of people have an acoustic guitar sitting there in, in their room. And I picked it, you know, picked it up to noodle a little bit. And it's like, oh, those strings are brand new. I changed them uh, three months ago. And I'm like, I didn't say this. I'm like, you have no idea. Three months ago, what are you talking about? I used to change strings on that guitar at least once a week, if not twice a week. That's what you do when you're disciplined and you play all the time. You have no choice. The coating on the string wears off very fast when you're playing lots of hours. The sound degrades. The intonation becomes poor. It was not uncommon for me to replace strings twice a week on that black guitar. I hit well over my thousands, thousand hours of practice. I played it in shows. Laura may remember this guitar. I know she came, her and Annie came and saw us a long time ago. I think I was playing that guitar in that show. The one on the right, although it's a lot more expensive, there's a lot of potential there. I haven't played it much yet. I want to. I've got five kids. I've got five kids in the way. There's a lot of potential, but I haven't even changed the strings. Hopefully you guys are getting the point. This is not about music. But an instrument of discipline or an instrument of disappointment? Which one do you want to be? Does this remind you of any parables that Jesus taught? It's at least one that pops in, into my mind. Parable of the talents. It's not about being talented as a musician. It's a matter of discipline. But the Lord, in Matthew 25, his Lord answered him and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have at least received my money back with interest. Man who did nothing. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In some sense, that black guitar has been sitting under a bed for a while. It's been in the case metaphor I was thinking of, in some ways it's buried. It is captured in time, and there's a lack of desire for me to even take it out. It's like it served its purpose. It has memory. It's there now. I kind of want it to stay there. And maybe that's the way God views us, is we go into the earth, put away. What kind of instrument were we? Are we one that is worth remembering? Are we one that exercised ourselves, disciplined ourselves appropriately? Romans 6, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. How will you use your freedom in Christ? How do you want to use the instrument God has given you? Do you want to be road-worn? To be road-worthy? Or do you want to be left new in the case? Stand and sing. <clears throat>